Okay, everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're into the home stretch, and as usual, uh, we've saved some of the best for last, and I'm very, very honored and pleased uh, to introduce the president of the International Society for Reef Studies, who will be giving the presidential talk. Um, Ruth Gates, who needs really no introduction, but I'll give it to you anyway. Um, her day job is as the director of the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, where she has an extremely active research program uh, recently was a recipient with a colleague of a very large grant, a uh, competitive grant from uh, the uh, Paul Allen Foundation for the work that she's doing, cutting edge work on being able to address climate change using science and technology to look at the ability to uh, work within adaptive ways of corals. And um, certainly my personal thanks to her for taking on the society at a very transitional point and taking it to new heights, that uh, the numbers are impressive. Um, this is 1,900 members and counting. I guess it's close to 2,000 now. And that's taken a great deal of hard work and leadership from a very special person. It's my pleasure to introduce the president of the International Society for Reef Studies, uh, my dear friend, Ruth Gates. Wow, that's all I can say. It's. The first day we got on the stage, I was totally intimidated by the audience, and I have to say that that feeling has not yet gone away. Um, so it is really a, a, a deep honor to be here today, and I want to, I will be talking today a little bit about the project that Bob uh, brought to the table, um, but really I'm using it as a vehicle to hang around a number of discussion points that I'd like to touch upon, um, and that really relate to finally, the way that we use our network and the way that we use our society. So today I'm going to be talking about harnessing basic science to advance solutions for coral reefs. And the first thing and the first point that I want to make is that the context for our change has radically shifted. I am not the first person to make this point, and I'm sure I will not be the last, because let's not forget, there are more sessions coming this afternoon. But really, when I started my career, and I got my undergraduate degree in 1984, and my PhD in 1990, I got fascinated because I had an amazing undergraduate lecturer who really raised coral reefs um, the profile of coral reefs using imagery in a classroom, that was Dr. Barbara Brown. And I was introduced to the symbiosis that I spent a large portion of my, my professional life studying um, and was fascinated by the symbiosis. I mean, how does this happen? How do you get to get an animal that can actually withstand having a plant cell or a photosynth photosynthesizing organism living inside its cells, inside its cells? Every time I say that out loud, I say, that is ludicrous, right? We can't tolerate that. We can't do that. How did the corals do that? And so that was really the framer for my entire career. I was fascinated by that phenomenon. I was, I was really uh, driven to understand it because it was just interesting. It was interesting. There was not really a, I hate to say at that point, there was no higher purpose to my work whatsoever. It was just really about the incredible opportunity to study and learn and understand the details of an interaction that frames a system that can be seen from space. So just by linkage, it's important. But it wasn't driven by any kind of an urgent need. Um, but we have a really urgent need now. Um, our urgent need is all about the way that coral reefs are performing in the context of environmental change. And we do, we've talked about climate change drivers and local pollution and overfishing and all of these framers for the ultimate problem, which is the degradation of the system before our very eyes, the horrific loss of this extraordinary part of our global ecosystems. I, recently analogized to the world is like a jigsaw, and what we're doing is we're, instead of forming a beautiful picture, we're gradually taking pieces out. And as we take pieces out, we disfigure the system, and it no longer looks the same. It is completely unnatural, and it functions poorly. It's so depressing, and we debate which is the most important thing, where does it happen most, 
we have high spots, we have low spots, and we, we think about the high spots and low spots, and we talk about the winners, and we talk about the losers. We talk about variation in our everyday science. It's everywhere. I remember when I was doing some of my early experimental work, um, I was trying to manipulate temperature in tanks in Discovery Bay. And I failed abysmally after about 22 hours of a 24-hour experiment where I had manipulated the temperature and then the power went out and the whole experiment went down. And, you know, when I was doing that experiment, I was thinking to myself, good God almighty, this is like really incredibly intense. How do I do this experiment in an ecologically relevant way? And, and when I looked at some of the data that came back, there were massive error bars on the damn thing. Every single one, I thought I'd got high replication, but actually what I had was this enormous bar. And then when I did the statistics, nothing looked great. It was a failure, it was a failure. And then I started thinking about the variation in a different way because I am really uh, ultimately a cup half full kind of gal. So what happens if the variation is real? If the biological variation exists and what we're seeing in each of these bars is actually real, right? And then when we scale that back out and we look at the response to climate change or stress in the environment, we see across all scales variation in the manifestation of stress in bleaching. This beautiful picture of a palmata showing a completely bleached upper surface and a totally brown undersurface. The upper surface unhealthy, the undersurface apparently looking healthy. Looking at the same species side by side on the reef, you can see one totally brown, the one right next door totally white. Scaling out to the species diversity, we see some species that are white and some that are brown, they're behaving differently. And then we scale out all the way to region. We know that there are certain reefs in places doing better than others, and sometimes these patterns are unexpected. Sometimes they're in the more pristine environments rather than the most abused environments. There is all kinds of crazy patterns going on. Um, and it's not actually that easy to interpret. So I said, well, I can't do this scale of like large scale regional stuff, so let's come down all the way to the organism and think about what we know about the performance of, of the organism itself. And really what we know is that who you are matters. Who you are matters. Your genetics is important. There are in every single population people who are good at things and people who are bad at things. And in this instance, we have individuals and species that do much better at responding to stress than others. Hence the error bars and some of the experimental data. I love that part. Um, who you partner with is critical. It's critical because you can have a partner who can be extremely good. And by partner, I really mean symbiont. It could be either a micro-eukaryotic symbiont, the same one that fascinated me originally, the dinoflagellate sitting inside your cell. You can partner with one and have a good outcome when you're exposed to, say, a temperature disturbance, or partner with another as the same host and have a bad outcome. And this is a great picture taken off the Great Barrier Reef by Madeline's group, showing that dichotomy of corals, acroporids, associating with seas and being bleaching susceptible, clade C, and being bleaching susceptible, or D, and somehow making it through that bleaching event. It appears like a thermal tolerant but we don't really know that the functionality is equivalent between these two interactions. It's the function that will ultimately dictate the outcome. But perhaps the thing that is least obvious and, le and, and most difficult to tease out is, is the implications of environmental history. You know, there are these fabulous anecdotes of reefs that do crazy things. You know, there's a place in Taiwan that has a reef that's exposed to six to nine degrees centigrade of temperature variation a day. A day. And it's so extraordinary because there's a flourishing reef there. And that means that the corals that live there are completely able and adapted to be there. There are the hot pools in American Samoa where there are flourishing, healthy communities of corals. The Red Sea, unexpectedly hot places with unexpectedly vibrant communities. And then there's Kaneohe Bay, the crazy Hawaiian Kaneohe Bay. People say it's not, not like any reef system we've ever been to before. And 
they're right. It's a crazy bay with lots of tiny patch reefs throughout the bay and a barrier reef and a fringing reef. In fact, it's every reef. It's every reef everywhere. But it was the toilet for so many years. And raw sewage was poured into that bay. And then the bay cleaned up when the sewage was diverted. And during that period of time when it was a toilet, there was very little live coral, but the live coral has flourished, and now we have an amazingly flourishing coral reef there. It's a great story. It's a story of hope. So there's loads of things that play into the variability, but in my opinion, they've been really within these who are you, who do you partner with, and what is your environmental context? Not only yours, but what was the context for your parents when they were doing their thing did they have interesting experiences? And did they settle in, in environments? Were they super, super performers in that environment? And were they able to then find unions with another? These are the things, the history, the pattern. We tease it out of our data. But what if we were to then use that and pull it forward? What if we were to capitalize on this variation and take the science, harness it, and think about how to use it to address the fundamental problem that the rates of change in the environment are outpacing the intrinsic capacity of the system to adapt. Reefs are declining at an alarming rate. So what if we were to try to think about ways to actually intervene, to really develop strategies to raise the resilience of the system? How would we go about doing that? Well, so at this point, there was this really big call for ideas from the Allen uh, Foundation. They said we want, they put out an international call for ideas to mitigate the impacts of climate change, CO2, in marine systems. And Madeleine Van Offen and I decided that this was a great time for us to think about how to actually articulate what we would do if we were attempting to think about advancing this, this sort of technology-driven strategy, a strategy that leverages this variation in the system, that focuses on survivors, what would that look like? And so we termed that approach assisted evolution, that we were essentially going to try and accelerate the, the, the rate at which natural processes occur with a goal of addressing the discrepancy between the timeline of evolution and natural turnover in a system and the actual rate of change in the environment. And we propose to do three different things to try and achieve that. The first, leveraging the knowledge that we have that history of environmental context is everything. And so we thought, well, what if we could induce that memory that is captured? What if there was a rapid way to advance a memory in an organism that would lift its thermal threshold or lift its ability to resist stress? How would we do that? Could we do that? How high? How long? Would you kill them? You know, really, this is the thematic idea. What makes, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Can you induce a memory? And that's, can you really affect epigenetic change, the reuse of gen existing genetic material, not the change in genetic sequence. Can we do it? And we thought we could. We thought we could put them in tanks and do things, and I'll get back to later, get back to that later. But then the other thing we were saying is, look, there's loads of, there's loads of individuals out there that seem to be doing better than expected in a place, in a place. And the inner place piece is critical. I work in Kaneohe Bay, and I would be out and was, in fact, out looking at corals. And you'd see, side by side, one individual doing well, not the other doing not so well. What if we were to convene and reproduce and breed all of the ones that were doing well, such that we would selectively or direct the stocks that are available to move into a restoration effort? At the end of the day, is that something we could do? It sounds trivial, but of course it's not. And of course, lastly, my own personal favorite, because I've been fascinated by symbiosis since the beginning of time, and since it appears that we are all really just hosts for microbes, the modification of the partners, the modification of the symbiosis, the modification of the microbiome. Could we do something to change the organism in its lifetime and 
that of its offspring to provision these individuals to perform better as we move forward and as climate change intensifies. Well, we, we were really, I mean, I think both Madeline and I were floored when we won the competition with this idea. And, um, and then came the hard work of actually writing the proposal and articulating how you would actually do it. Um, and we do it and are doing it. We were funded on this project last June, and, and it's a transformative amount of money, certainly for me. And I think transformative will be the word for the field. So to give you an idea, we, we really articulated a series of experiments that would be done where we simulate future ocean conditions and we expose corals that we already know are performing well. And you would ask, how would you know that they were performing well? How do you identify the great performers? The unfortunate reality is nature helped us. We had back-to-back -back bleaching events in 2014 and 2015 here in Hawaii for the first time ever. Unprecedented bleaching, which created this unique opportunity to identify the strongest in the community. So in 2014, already we were starting to see, yes, we can distinguish within the species that exist in Kaneohe Bay, individuals that are great and individuals that aren't doing so great. Some of those individuals actually died, but surprisingly few, perhaps speaking to this extraordinary resilience in Kaneohe Bay that reflects its prior very disturbed history. Um, and again, in 2015, after we were funded, we had a much more intense bleaching event, and it was much more widespread. And actually, we again saw some of the corals in Kaneohe Bay bleach while others remained completely healthy. Now, I know that this may be unusual, because in some places on the Great Barrier Reef, this is not the case. Every single individual appears to be, have been wiped out. Um, and so this particular type of approach in our hands seemed like a very viable way forward, but potentially to apply to the Northern Great Barrier Reef right now is completely non-feasible. And I think the point I want to make here is we chose a set of actions that we felt was good use of our science and attempted to forward those. But those aren't the only things that we could do as a community. There are many, many other things that we can think about and creatively pull out of the box to explore these type of creative solutions to the problem that's ahead of us. What do we do? How do we stabilize the system? But in our experiments, we, we really leverage technology to do these incredible environmental simulations. I mean, really, the art of controlling environment is, is really nuanced now. And, and we are using these outdoor tanks. And I'll come to the comparison between what we're doing in Hawaii and Australia in a minute. Um, and we're working with these almost monospecific reefs. You can see there's very few coral species that exist in Kaneohe Bay. Now, that is also an advantage because we are going to sequence every genome for the corals that we have in Kaneohe Bay. Every single one of those genomes will be released in real time to the field to build the capacity for data within the field. But extraordinary, the low diversity helps us here because we can start to address the genomic resources that represent the foundational species in an entire ecosystem in Hawaii. Not so simple in much higher diversity systems. So a lot of our experiments are really framed by the inducing acclimatization and experience and giving corals bumps in exposure to see what happens. And, monitoring their responses, looking at growth rates, looking at their, their capacity to withstand future insults of simulated climate change, looking at how their skeletons grow, looking at how their metas metabolism looks, looking at their microbiome, looking at their dinoflagellates, looking across many attributes in the biology to get a really good understanding of what these exposures do, not only to the adult corals that we're working with, but to the next generation. What do we accomplish, if anything? And these are the experiments that are happening right now. And they're very exciting, but extremely time consuming, extremely people consuming to do. And of course, I'm sure you're all looking at the fact that they're all done in the lab. 
and going, well, how could you possibly move this kind of thing out into the natural setting? Bear with me. The second set of activities that we're doing are the selective breedings. And, you know, as I mentioned, when you know who's strong, you know who to breed. Or when you know who's weak, you know who to breed. And we do these crosses where we're looking at the strongest and the weakest together, the strongest and the strongest, the weakest and the weakest, all combinations. The goal is to understand what happens when you breed different types or different corals with different capacity to withstand stress with one another. Does any of that adult capacity translate into the next generation? And um, it's an extraordinarily comprehensive analysis. Obviously, just getting fertilization isn't where we're at. We need to get these things settled, and we need to get these things growing, and we need to assess how those new generations now respond to simulated future ocean conditions. Have we achieved anything? Is all this effort worth it? Um, we're in these experiments right now, but what I can say is that we have been able to selectively breed, and we are in the midst of these experiments right now because we are in the spawning time of year right now. And this particular set of work, of course, creates enormous opportunities for us to collaborate with other people who are doing similar things. And I will talk a lot about the community of players that are needed to come to the table to think about the scale of this issue. As well as the strong performers in Hawaii, we have this extraordinary microspatial gradient in condition. And it exists across the space of Kaneohe Bay. We have some reefs that are highly variable in condition. That is, the temperature goes up and down like a yo-yo, and the CO2 goes up, and the pH and the, the um, acidification goes up and down. And we have other places where it's much flatter. So we, we actually have populations that are adapted to those conditions. And so we do small assisted migrations from one place to another to see whether or not, we call them reciprocal transplants in experimental language. We call them assisted migrations or mini assisted migrations in management speak, different language, different different type of words being used to describe similar things. The scientists among you will exactly know what we're talking about with reciprocal transplantation. The managers will know what assisted migration is. Moving things from one place to another to see if the history in one place gives you a leg up in another. And then the modification of algal symbionts, which I actually believe is probably the most difficult of the things to do, because I'm of a believer that the tuning between the type of symbiont that you have and your host is actually really important, that there are really amazing patterns that absolutely have to be maintained and that when these break down, that you start to see a degradation in the system that reflects changes in the immunology of the system, that these individuals are no longer able to keep their boundaries up so they can be invaded easily. But in Kaniwi Bay, we have corals that are almost all specifists with a type of symbiont that is rarely found outside the symbiosis. And um, the most robust symbiont type that I've ever seen that really unites with one of the most robust coral hosts on the planet is, is a symbiont called C15. And it's a very, 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 very specific interaction. We think it's, it's extraordinary at feeding its hosts. And the question is, could we take something that is an amazing giver to one particular group of corals and insert it into another highly specific coral that's very dominant in Kaneohe Bay, um, and could we successfully maintain that new combination? And we don't know the answer to this, and in fact, I think it's probably the highest risk part of the work, um, but we are exploring the hypothesis or the idea that the window to do such manipulations would probably be early in the life history of these corals, and that's based on science that shows that many corals are entrepreneurial in their early interactions with symbionts, and that you could potentially direct that relationship at that time. And if you can get the window to close, you could potentially maintain an unusual or atypical symbiosis. So that is the, my, this is the, the manipulation of the, the, the algal endosymbiont. But 
Of course, there's some really easy things you can do with the microbiome. Corals give off a lot of mucus on a regular basis, and so you can transfer the microbiome from one individual to another very easily. So these are all experiments that are in play right now. And you know, we're doing these types of experiments in two different places, leveraging two completely different biological contexts, and also totally different capacity. All of the experiments that we're doing in Hawaii are really in outdoor tanks or indoor tanks that are fed by natural seawater coming right off the reef. And we're working with indiv individual corals that are generally freshly collected and maintained that are adjacent to our setting. And in Australia, this incredible sea simulator has been built. It's an extraordinary place. It's an indoor aquarium setting where experimental con conditions can be controlled to the nth degree and everything is really, really tight. It's, you know, we're at a field lab doing things that aren't quite as tight. You know, I, I, I laughingly say our corals are really, you know, much more runty and they're treated a bit more runty than the ones in Australia because the ones in Australia are pampered. They're in a five star, ours are in a kind of three star. You know, when the question is, do those stars really matter? Is it important to do the experiments in places that are kind of, you know, seeing lots of different things? I mean, our Kaniwe Bay water is, is habitually polluted by sediment and chemicals that are just rushing in with major rainwater. The water in, in Australia in the sea simulator is controlled. That sort of variation doesn't exist. And, and really our question is, what should we do? If we were to do this and scale this, what would be the best way to scale it? Would, would it be isolated or integrated with a natural system? And that's obviously hugely important to answer as you go forward. But how do we deal with the differences in diversity? It's all very well and good for me. I feel fabulous because I'm in Hawaii and I can work on almost every species that is dominant. But how do we deal with this extraordinary diversity in the Great Barrier Reef? How do we take these ideas and think about applying them well, my own sense is the species thing is really, really difficult, but there are certain attributes that we find that are common to specific groups of corals. And so a lot of our work is really focused on more functional attributes that can be harnessed to advance these mechanisms and these solutions. And so we focus our work on massives and branching and encrusting and, and, and uh, plating, brooders and spawners. And some of the things that we're doing are much easier to do with a brooder than they are to do with a spawner. For example, a lot of the long-term acclimatization work is much easier to do with a brooder because the broods are produced in a much more regular fashion. And we can get to an end point with our discussion much more quickly than we could with spawning. Spawning is so ephemeral that it makes it difficult to work with on a regular basis. But of course, there's all those people who are working on the cryopreservation of corals. And what if they could cryopreserve the egg sperm and larvae? of corals. That would be a game changer in terms of the type of work that we could do in this particular realm. And so we are trying really hard to compare the same species from two different places because it's important to understand how space plays into response. And many of the experimental challenges that we have are tuned to the types of simulated conditions that will be in those places, not to these generic, big, scaled, models. So it's really important in our study, we're trying to accommodate the design early. But really, when we step back from this and what we're doing, we've hit a lot of criticism for stepping out of the box with this, for saying that time is time, enough is enough, reefs are degrading, and I personally, as a biologist, feel a responsibility to take my science and use it to try and help. That was really my, my position. I'm a biologist, for God's sake. What can I do with my knowledge that will actually advance an agenda that could help? I'm not saying that will help, because it's critical to understand that this is a proof of concept project. This is about science. We are doing exactly the same science as we've always done. It's rigorous, 
it's evidence-based. And people say, well, when are you going to be ready to actually implement and put this out on the reef? And I said, I have really no idea, because guess what? The data are not yet in. And the data will drive the next step. It will tell us what we should do next. We can't preempt that because we proposed something. We can't say that it will. And I really feel it's important to think about how science actually advances. It advances because we do things, we try things, we experiment with things, new knowledge is acquired, not because we know what the outcome is gonna be, but because we don't know. That's what science is about for me, anyway. So when we got a lot of this criticism, it was clear that m much of the criticism, and it, all of these points are absolutely valid. This is exactly the discussion that we should be having right now, but it speaks to a set of activities that are down line. We are not there right now, and that's great because now all these points have been raised. We can think about it early in planning. We can try to address, we can think about how to use modeling and scenario tools to really ask and answer the question of how we avoid genetic narrowing. But to be honest, in that particular place, I keep stepping back from our science but, and saying, hang on a minute, genetic narrowing. It's a big problem, and nature is doing the greatest genetic narrowing ever right now. We are losing biodiversity and genetic diversity like it's going out of fashion as climate change intensifies. So nature's doing that for us. Perhaps what we can do is assist in the reverse of that, which is the maintenance of genetic diversity, applying techniques early to actually maintain and avoid the genetic narrowing that has happened in some breeding circumstances when species have been pushed too far. Now, Madeline and I and many others in this room attended a workshop in Australia earlier this year. And for me, there was one point that I took away that was profound. And we worked with people who were in the same discussion with different types of organisms, small mammals, trees. The take home was this. You should intervene early because the risks associated with early intervention tend to be much lower. Everybody said, we wished we started earlier. We wished we hadn't waited until our species were listed. Because then you have little diversity to work with. And it made me really think about how we approach these problems. We go to the most endangered or the rarest, but we don't necessarily think about strategies that can actually maintain or sustain the diversity that is actually the structural end member, the things, the majority, that are actually doing the thing that they need to do, which form the reefs. It's a big discussion point for me. How do we do this? How do we balance rarity with abundance? What do we do? Where do we put our efforts? And so, you know, for Kaneohe Bay, that's not a discussion we have to have, because we can work on pretty much everything that's there. Um, but most of our work is really on the dominant ecological types rather than the rare ecological types. But the thing about this project, I think, and I'm going to really speak to something that I think will resonate with many people, and really the reason why I sort of decided a while back to think a little bit differently about our science was because I was reading proposals and papers that were describing work and at the end of the paper, it would always say this. And this work is directly relevant to the conservation and management of coral reefs. It was, it was like a, a mantra attached to every paper that I was reading. And frankly, I was doing the same thing. And then I realized in a discussion with myself one day that I actually had no idea what was actually relevant to the conservation and management of reefs. Because guess what? That's not what I do. Um, and that started a whole journey for me, where I started to talk really comprehensively with very many different types of people, people doing types of things that I had no idea. You know, I remember managers saying to me, look, if you think it's a good idea, tell me, because I have to make a decision, and I have to do something. And I'd rather do something that you're 50% sure about than something that I'm 0% sure about. 
that was really informative for me because it made me think about the discrepancy between the science conversation and the 95% confidence, and then the actual need on the ground to take action to preserve systems, and who the people making those decisions were. So as we move this particular project forward, we really sat down and thought about the values that would be embedded in the project. And this really reflects the fact that it's an urgent problem. We've all heard talks this week about how quickly things are going bad. And really, the timelines, we don't have a lot of time to pause. That means that for the first time ever, we have to release the data as quickly as we can. We have to interact our information with as many people as possible. We have to be prepared to change the way we do business with our academic returns. Right? I've always had a problem with the, uh, I've got to wait to tell people about this until it's published. Because it's taking me years to get things published. Now, that's probably because a lot of my work is bad. But it's taking a long time for me to get stuff published. And that means the pace at which science is advancing is slowing, not speeding. And climate change is racing. So that started to worry me. And quite frankly, I looked around at all my colleagues and I realized, there are other people doing exactly the same work as I'm doing, but I didn't know they were doing it, and they didn't know I was doing it. That means the resources could have gone somewhere else. It's redundant. It's redundant. So much redundant effort. And so we decided that with this project that we would really start to think about how to open the doors with the data. Let's report everything that we get. Let's not be just so sensitive about being really good. Let's be prepared to admit our failures. Because let's face it, that's what experimental science is about. You fail more often than you win. And actually, in my experience, I have learned more from my failures than I have from my wins. Because I just feel great about the win. OK, moving right along to the next thing. Right? You don't spend time with the win, but when you fail, you're introspective about, God, I wonder what I could have done differently. You know, I could have really changed this if I'd just done that one thing earlier. You know, you spend a lot of time dissecting your own poor performance. Right? So I think that in this project, we try very hard, and it's difficult to think about the importance of team, to acknowledge all of the players. And there's people like me who are the mouthpieces. There are students on the ground who are actually doing all the work. There are postdocs who are really in that creative thinking mode, doing a lot of the, oh, if we just tweak it this way, they're, they're, they're still hands on. They're actually talking to the project manager. Everybody has a role in this party. It could not be done with all of these people in the party doing the thing that they do at their most excellent. And I love that idea of these teams of people convening their excellent and using that complementary skill set to grow an effort that's so much bigger than any one of those particular communities could accomplish. And so we really are, and we work on this. It's hard. Team is hard. The academic reward systems make it difficult not to think about what you personally will get out of it. I don't care now because I've already got a career. It doesn't matter to me as much. And so I have to be careful to not kind of, you know, be over-projecting that position either, trying to protect people to make sure they get the return that they need at their, at their stage. But really asking people with skills that can help us advance as quickly as possible into the game. And, you know, in our game, we have people who were husbandry specialists for fish in the state for four years and, and have come to the table and said, I have these skills. I don't know if they're appropriate. Could we help? Or we are machinists, and we know you're building a lot of equipment. Um, could I help? It's incredible to see that the openness actually draws more people in, and the impact of that is quite huge on the way our project goes. And this is just a lovely picture of the team. Um, one of my, my groups, Spawning Nights, very recently last month, and then a meeting of all of the younger members of our group, both from Australia and here in Hawaii, that happened last Saturday without myself and Madeline, which we think was probably a good thing for everybody. Um, 
But I guess that what I want to say is that we have shifted the way that we're doing business. And I'd be completely idiotic not to say that, wow, I hope we do achieve something that can move into an implementation, that can inform a solution, that can complement existing efforts to build resilience on reefs, to restore damaged and fragmented reefs, to gray, the green, the gray structures. You know, there's concrete going in all over the world to protect coastline as the reefs degrade. And they're often pouring onto live coral. It's shocking, quite frankly. What if we could plant those structures and make them live again and make them sinks? Well, why not? You know, these are the types of things that we're thinking about. But the million dollar question then is, is any of this scalable? I mean, really, that's the hardest one to address. And, and you know, I'm going to say right off the bat that, you know, I deliberately put this picture up. It's a lovely picture of Holly Putnam, who's a really main driver in this project, and my super tech, Jen Davison, who is standing there by tanks with lots of fragments in. And then there's a reef right next door. Look, how do we take the efforts that are here in these tanks and scale them to the scale of reefs? How do we help whole reefs, what do we do? How can we accomplish it? And, you know, my position is that we interact our science now as we get it with as many people as we can. We talk to others doing similar work in other places. Many of these conversations are with people that traditionally scientists wouldn't interact with, right? How do we get to that network? I don't know. We call on all of our friends. We say, I'm looking for somebody to interact me with anybody doing this in that place. Restoration is happening everywhere, everywhere. Imagine if we could just have a conversation to talk about what we already know. Yes, there are winners and there are losers, and if you have an array, you should probably mix those up or put the, the winners close to each other. And yes, when they sexually reproduce, put your platforms close to a natural reef so when they do reproduce, they seed the reef right next door. Can we implant some super performers onto some degraded reefs in Kaneohe already. It would be a good idea to do that. Why? Because we would reconnect fragmented populations. We could potentially take uh, a, an area 10 by 10 with two corals of one species at either side of that area, plant a couple in between, and produce a bridge to interact the genetics. That's such a small thing to do. It's such a, a little thing to do. Are we doing that? Could we select those to be the strongest to help build the resilience at the same time? I think we can do that. Will I do that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Will I be in the conversation? I hope so. Can I help translate my science to as many people who could use it? I hope so. That's my role. I'm a scientist. This is what I do. I'm a scientist and I'm a communicator, but I don't scale. I don't manage. I don't do many of the things that need to be done. And am I the best judge of how that should be done? I don't think I am. I don't think I am. So in my mind then, we're really building this sort of rationale for a sense of an interactome. We are all coming together with our different disciplines. I talked about it at the group level, at the scale of an individual scientific group with people doing different things, the sum of which make a much larger effort. Now I'm talking about the interacting of many different stakeholder communities and the, the, the conversations and the, and the conversations that will unravel why we don't speak the same language or what the parallel language is in our worlds. I mentioned reciprocal transplant, assisted migration. You know, these are different languages and it's a little bit like when molecular biology came to the forefront. You know, I did not get any molecular biology training as an undergraduate. And so when I retrained as a postdoc, I had to learn a whole new language. And I feel like I do that over and over again. And this is another time when the build on community will involve many conversations, some of which might not be very comfortable, because we will have perceptions about what's going on 
that really aren't grounded, and we have to go through that. It's the same as having these huge debates in our own scientific communities. Um, it's often not that great. But how and where do we implement? I don't know. This is the million dollar question, right? Because it isn't probably possible to do it everywhere. And this is the question of where and how do you put in marine protected areas? You know, would we, would we try to raise the resilience of a reef that is a source population for many others in a region? In my opinion, yes, right? Where do we get our source populations from? Do we get them from pristine environments or do we take the runt of the litter the ones that are still persisting in the harbors that are so polluted that nothing really should live there. How do we make those decisions? I don't know, but I know that these are the conversations that we need to be having. And if we have them, and we can start to parallelize activities in multiple locations, we can start to scale the initiative in a way that can make a difference because it will be scaled and people in those places will do work that is tuned to the specifics of their place, the context, the relative abundance of the different functional groups interacted with the methodologies that seem to work best for that functional group. You can see how you can start a movement of people. And even if we fail, we've engaged a huge number of people in that discussion, and we've advanced an agenda that will drive a much greater presence in driving policy, people who will push their decision makers. So the project is not disconnected. None of the things that we're doing are disconnected from this bigger picture. And I'm absolutely clear that if we do not mitigate fossil fuel burning, if we do not stay climate change, none of this will really matter. It will just be the Band-Aid that got us to a place where it was ripped off and there was a weeping wound underneath it. I'm hoping we can use these approaches and many others that many others are actually working on or already implementing to sustain and stabilize the system as we take care of this bigger issue. It's gonna be absolutely critical to keep that ordering in mind. We should never compete mitigation with adaptation. We should never compete one way of doing a, a thing versus another way. It's not time for that. We should do everything, everything in our toolbox right now because there is such an urgent need. And you know, I'm just gonna say that I attended, I've attended, my first conference was in 1996 and I remember one of my incredible mentors stood on the stage his name was Len Muscatine, and he said, you people have to stop eating your young. You people have to stop competing, right? And I thought at the time, he's absolutely right. How the hell do we do that? How do we do that within the framework of the current academic reward systems? What do we do? How do we make better use of our resources? And really, I think he was calling for a build on community, and I, I'm calling for a build on community and saying, look, we have mechanisms to do this. We have many networks that exist that can be, that can facilitate the conversation. There are places for you to go to be a participant. And I can only urge you to start to get involved. And obviously now I'm standing here as the president of a society that we know can make a difference. And that difference will be bigger and bigger the larger our membership is. We can do more and more the more people are there. We can have greater effect as a community than we can ever have as individuals. We've got to act together. And so I hope, I hope that if there's anybody in this room who's not a member of the ISRS or not participating in a network like the Coral Reef, the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Networks, not in the conversation about any of the new networks that are looking like they're gonna go in. I hope everybody will find their nearest network and join it. And I hope everybody in this room will come and join us at ISRS. Thank you very much. Thank you.